being a, a great help always. Uh, thank you, Leanne. We had a great day yesterday. Uh, we had visitors here to the church. We were able to share the good news of the gospel. Uh, several have met said that they would love to come back. Uh, they uh, just felt uh, very welcomed. Uh, and we had a booth down at the library again. So we we're just thankful for that opportunity to share God's word, to have materials available for the town. And uh, we look forward to doing more of that, um, to be a witness and a light in this town. Uh, to, to open up the church more uh, and to be the light that the church is meant to be, uh, to, to call people to come to Christ. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful for that opportunity um, to witness uh, here in the town. Uh, Father's Day again. Fathers are such a blessing. And the Bible tells us that the husband is to be the head of the household, submitting to Christ to be the spiritual leader of the home. This needs to be restored in our culture today. Fathers and husbands need to be put in their proper position, and they need to understand that position, that they are to be the leaders of the home, submitting to Christ to love their wives as Christ loved the church. If that would happen, we would see amazing results in our land uh, for families and for our culture. Uh, so we, we are just so thankful again today for fathers. And I love Psalm 103. As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. What a great reminder that we all have a heavenly father, a loving heavenly father who shows compassion on us to save us, to call us his children, to be adopted into his kingdom, to his family, as we've talked about going through Galatians, that we are adopted into the kingdom of God as his children. And nothing could be greater because, because we are his children, we receive the full benefits of the family of God. So I'm thankful for that. Um, we had a great week at Camp Sen uh, dinner last Sunday at Camp Sentinel for all those who came. Those who were not, we plan to do it again at some point, so we'll let you know when that happens. Uh, it was just a great time of fellowship uh, and a great meal. We want to thank Camp Sentinel uh, for their uh, being there for us, and we're, we're great, to, great for them to partner with them. Next Sunday, I plan to be here. Uh, Kevin, Pastor Kevin Van Brunt is going to be here from Camp Sentinel uh, to share the, the word. Uh, and to share about Camp Sentinel and the, the mission there. Uh, so next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday uh, as we welcome Pastor Kevin to the pulpit to proclaim the Word of God. So hope you all can uh, be here for that. Uh, outside of that, uh, the, the board is just going to have a quick uh, meeting after the service uh, regarding some um, funding uh, that we need to uh, tithe. Uh, a gift was given to the church, uh, so through an estate, and we want to make sure that we're faithful to the Lord. And uh, we tithe all our giving; ten percent of all the offering goes to missions. So we want to make sure we, we just need to make, do some house cleaning on that, make sure that we put that money into our missions that came out. So to bless those around us, to bless the community, and to be faithful to Him as we tithe uh, what we receive back to the Lord. He's blessed us so much. So. The board will be meeting uh, right after the service uh, for that quick uh, meeting. So, if I missed anything, any? Should we give thanks to the state? Yes. Uh, it's, uh, so we received, yeah, we'll let, <laughs> talk about it a little bit more. Uh, the estate of Yvonne Hill, uh, she was a member here for quite some time. Um, Deacon Emeritus, Deacon Emeritus. Um, she was here long before I got here, but I'm thankful for her doing so, putting us in consideration for her estate. So we received 14,000 plus. So we want to make sure again, we're, we're, we're thankful for that, uh, that the Lord blessed her, that the Lord would bless us, and that we would give that back. So. Again, that's what that meeting is for, just real briefly after the service, you know, to make sure that we uh, appropriate and tie that uh, funding. So we want to make a, an official movement of the board to uh, put that, at least 10% of that, if not more, into uh, missions. 
Leanne will be passing, happy Father's Day again. Leanne has some, uh, a little small token of appreciation to all our dads. She'll be passing them out during the first hymn. So again, thank you to all our dads and fathers. Uh, most importantly, our Heavenly Father. So are you hungry this morning? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for his, for his name's sake? I hope you are. I hope you're here to be fed, to be fed the word of God, to hear from God, not from me, but to hear from God's word, and to be filled, and to be filled and have your cup overflow, because that's what the Lord, word of God does. He, our cup runneth over, as Psalm 23 says, and he is the bread of life, and he gives us that life. So I hope you're hungry this morning, and I hope you're thirsty in the spiritual sense. I am. And I am so blessed for each and every one of you to be here this morning, again on this Father's Day, as we remember our fathers who have gone on to be with the Lord, gone on ahead of us, those are fathers that are, are with us, for our children, for our wives, our families. What a great day to celebrate family. That's what these holidays are about, Mother's Day, Father's Day. It really is ultimately about the family and the, and the, and the family that God's, God has given us. So we are so thankful for this day. And again, I, I pray that you're hungry, hungry for God's word, to, to worship him in spirit and in truth. So in doing that, let's turn now to our call to worship on page 202. And where it says, youth and children, we're all youth and children. <laughs> Please feel free to read in with that as well. Because we're all children at heart. Please stand for the call to worship. His love endures forever. From Psalm, oh, from Psalm 136. His love endures forever. Or give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. To him alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. Give thanks to God of heaven. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Endures forever. Let's continue with worship as we sing our first hymn. On page 358. Because he lives. God sent his son, they call him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died. To buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. He knows he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives 
but greater still the calm assurance the child can face on certain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives and then one day i'll cross the river i'll fight life's final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory i'll see the lights of glory and i know he reigns because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives amen andy can you turn my mic on for a second Just want to say thank you, uh, how blessed we are today to have David Neistad back at the piano. It's been so long, David. We are so blessed to have you back and to hear the music from that piano from your, your hand. That Amen. We've missed you greatly, and uh, I, I just thank you for uh, being able to play today. Thank you, David. So, Amen. Let's go to our second hymn now as we sing Jesus Saves on page 438. Heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Did the tidings all around? Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps that cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Waved it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell the sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea. Echo back ye ocean craves. Earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart of mercy craze shouts around the open tomb Jesus saves Jesus saves give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves Jesus saves let the nations now rejoice 
Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You can keep playing, David. I, I love it. We could say that all day. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. What a blessing. And we're so thankful again to have David back at the piano. We love you too, Chris. We're so thankful for you being here every week as well. Let's go to prayer this morning as we come before the Lord to be Bless, with all our blessings, our prayers, our requests, as we come before him this morning. Heavenly Father, on this day we celebrate in this land as Father's Day, Lord, we are thankful for our fathers. We are thankful for the family. And, oh, Lord, more importantly, we are thankful for you, our Heavenly Father, a Father that we call Abba Father. For, Lord, you have adopted us as your children, and we are so thankful for that. We are thankful that you sent your one and only Son into this world, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay the sin debt that we could not pay, to atone for our sins, because you, Lord, had compassion on us, as a father has compassion on his children. O oh Lord, you have compassion on those who fear you. Lord, we have heard that joyful sound that you do save. Lord, we want to spread that all around, spread that news to every land. Onward is your command that you save, Jesus saves. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you are there for us, that you are in our presence, Lord, today. We are here to worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. Lord, we hunger and thirst for righteousness for your name's sake. It is a joy to be here, Lord, in your presence as your family, your people, and I'm so thankful, Lord, for the congregation. Lord, as we remember this day, our brothers and sisters are gathered in other places, proclaiming your name across this world, Lord. We lift our voices in unison, for we are one body in you. Father, we thank you. I thank you for Pastor Nate and Harvest Church in Gilmanton. We ask you bless him this morning as he proclaims the word, his congregation, for Pastor Jim, for Pastor John, for Pastor Josh, and so many others, Lord, that we lift up before you this morning in their congregations. We are so blessed to be here this morning in this small body, but knowing that we are part of your church the church universal, from all generations. What a joy it is, Lord, to be in your family, the great family of God, your kingdom. Father, we, this morning we lift up Merrill from Shepherd's Way. Oh, Lord, you know the health issues that he faces. Father, we just ask your healing hand upon him. But we praise you as he's had new board members to the ministry in Manchester helping the homeless there. Thank you, Lord, for that ministry, and thank you for Merle. Oh, Lord, he's been afflicted physically, but spiritually, Lord, nothing will stop him because you go before him. We're thankful that we can partner with him in that ministry. Lord, we're thankful for the, all the books and Bibles and devotions that were given yesterday and delivered so that they can go across this world, Lord, and boxed up and sent to those who want your word and are hungering for it and to know more about you. Lord, we thank you for yesterday that we had the opportunity 
at the library and here at the church to witness and to, to tell others about you, to point to you, Lord. Oh, Lord, pray, we pray for each and every one who came, the friendships that were made. Oh, Lord, most importantly, Lord, we just lift those, everyone who came to you, that they know you, that they worship you. We pray for Moses in Rwanda. We lift up his church and his family. Oh, Lord, as Rwanda appears to be going into another lockdown. Oh, Lord, we, we just pray that how you can help us to bless them as a church, helping with some of their needs. We lift up the Aspire Pregnancy Center in Laconia. We thank you, Lord, for all the work that they do, for not just the mothers, but for the dads that come through the door. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that ministry and that we can partner with them. Father, we just are so grateful for all that you do. This morning we lift up a coworker of Andy's who's having a baby today. Oh Lord, on this Father's Day, what a blessed day to have a, have a baby. So we pray for this, this new birth and this new life. We pray for the mom, the, the, new, the new life that's coming to this world, this child. We thank you for the gift of life. Father, be with them. Lord, I lift up my cousins as they're continuing to mourn the loss of my Aunt Audrey. Thankful for the message that was given by Pastor Culp at Fort Square. Oh Lord, the gospel was proclaimed, just how Aunt Audrey would, would want it, that you would be lifted high. And we pray for them tomorrow for the interment ceremony at Bourne National Cemetery. Be with them and comfort them at this time of loss. Again, Father, we pray for our pastors. Be with them as they proclaim the word of God boldly. Lift, we lift them up before you. We thank you and praise you that David was back behind the piano today, Lord, to pr praise you through, through music. We thank you for the very special gift that you've given him to play for you, Lord. Not for anyone else, but to play for you, to glorify you through music, and that we can sing along and to sing your praises. Lord, we lift up Ronald with eye problems this morning. We pray for the family of a, of a passing of a father. We pray for Marie, for prayer for her mortgage, for her daughter Bethany and Daniel. We pray for a family traveling today to Colorado. Oh, Lord, we lift them up before you. For Abby, who's taking a nursing test on Monday, we lift her up before you. Give her the knowledge. We thank you for the knowledge that you give, you've given her. Oh, Lord, we know that she will do well, and she will serve you well in North Carolina as she serves as a nurse. Thank you, Father, that you've put her in that position. We thank you for all our doctors and nurses and those who care for those who are infirmed, who need care, we lift them up to you today. We pray for all our nursing home workers. Oh Lord, those difficult jobs, but jobs that they do to serve others and to help others. We lift up our military this morning, Father. Oh, be with those who are serving voluntarily to protect our freedoms around the world. We pray for our government. O oh Lord, we need men and women in places of position in government, Lord, to change this land, to point to you that we will once again be one nation under God, that the hearts of this nation will be turned back to you. Father, heal our land. We need you more than ever in America and in the world. As we see the darkness seeming to grow ever greater, Lord, the light shines even brighter. For you are the light of the world. O oh Lord, nothing can put out your light. For you are greater. You are sovereign over all things. And in Lord, we rest in that, and it gives us hope and peace. We give you praise, Lord, for Nancy O'Connor and family. Going home, uh, we thank you for Claire Currier and her witness and her love for you. 
Oh Lord, thank you for the Wednesday and Thursday night prayer meetings here at the church. And oh Lord, this special gift that was given to us. Oh Lord, help us to be faithful with all the resources that you have blessed us with. And thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful in providing. So Lord, now we come before you, thanking you for this day, thanking you for all that you have done for us. And Lord, again, we thank you for our dads. And most importantly, you, Lord, our Heavenly Father. Now that as we come before you to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. O come, let us adore him on page 196 as we prepare our hearts to hear from the Lord this morning. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. His name forever, we'll praise his name forever. We'll praise his name forever, Christ the Lord. We'll give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory. We'll give him all the glory, Christ the Lord. For he alone is worthy, for he alone is worthy, for he alone is worthy, Christ the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Continuing this morning, so if you turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians 5. We'll be reading from verses 7 through 12. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling, troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Amen. Some tough words there from the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Very tough words. But as we continue this morning in Galatians, chapter 5, verses 7 through 12, we know in the prior verses to this, as we had learned from last week, Paul had just explained that our freedom, that our freedom is in Christ alone and to be found in him alone, that we as believers have no freedom in the law, or Christ and the law. It is Christ alone. It is his saving grace alone where our freedom is from. We do not add anything or take away anything from the gospel. It is from him alone, by faith alone. We have salvation not by any good thing that we have done, 
not by anything that we have given, not anything of our own merit. We only have salvation by what he has done for us. And in that we glory. And we give him thanks. For Christ did it all. The finished work of the cross. What Christ did on the cross. He purchased our pardon. Amen. He purchased it for us. That is the freedom that we have. To know that we are no longer under God's wrath that we are free from sin and we do not need to carry that weight, that burden anymore. That we do not have to keep the law and keep it fully. For Christ already did that for us. He took our place on the cross. He lived a perfect life. And he paid that penalty because he did. He was the sinless, perfect lamb of God. He was the only one that could do it. And in that we rejoice message titled this morning is keep your eyes on the truth keep your eyes on the truth and by the truth I mean Christ keeping your eyes on the truth for Christ is the truth he is the way he is the truth and he is the life and he purchased our pardon on the cross he became sin who knew no sin taking the full weight of God's wrath upon himself for us. And what's even more amazing, we think about Father's Day, it pleased the Father to do so. It pleased God to crush him under the full weight of sin so that we would not have to be. We, his children, would be living in freedom forever with him. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound and that is the amazing grace that he came for us and what he did for us. It's, it's so hard to even comprehend. We can't comprehend it fully. I look forward to that day when we can sit at his feet, at his throne, and glory in him forever, knowing that in him we have freedom perfectly for all eternity. For he did what we cannot do. For we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus, did, Jesus was perfect. He was slain for sinners, you and me. Paul here now transitions in our text. Speaking of that freedom that we, we have in Christ. The freedom of salvation. The freedom of the burden from the weight of the law and sin and death. He's transitioning now, speaking clearly to the Galatians and firmly, as we have just read. Firing a warning shot really across the bow of the false teachers and those who would twist the gospel, twist the truth for their own uplifting, not for the uplifting of Christ. For here, Paul, who had just preached the pure gospel of Jesus to the Galatians, by Christ, by faith alone, those same believers now had come under false teachers who had crept in, as we've been learning through the book of Galatians, the Judaizers, those who were adding works to the gospel. In a sh very short time, Paul hadn't been gone that long, and he heard reports that these Judaizers had come in to the church and were now adding to salvation the gospel that he had taught them. Paul's not going to let them fall away. He's not going to let the believers in Galatia fall away to this false teaching. Here in this letter, he's pointing them back to the truth. And that's what we do. We keep our eyes on the truth. Do not turn from the truth. Do not deviate from God's word. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know the song. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Keep your eyes on the truth. And it is not, it's, it's easy to be led uh, swayed. It is. Let's not think it isn't. For we have so many distractions today, even all around us. But let us stand firm. And let us resolve to stand firm in God's word. To be faithful to him. 
to recognize falsehood and false teaching when we see it and hear it. And the only way to do that is to keep your eyes on God's word, to be in God's word and to be in prayer every day. Here in this letter, again, Paul's pointing them back to the truth, and he's using sound arguments. He's using Scripture. He's pointing them to Scripture, as he has throughout this whole book, to remind them of the truth. Keep your eyes on the truth. Let's turn to verse 7. You were running well, he says. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? See, when Paul left Galatia, the church was in great shape. He implies it here in this verse. You were running well. You were running great. You had the truth when I left. You were following the truth. You were obeying the truth. You were in the word, studying the word, hungering and thirsting for the word. It's the same for us. When you came to Christ, you start off well. Well, keep running well. Keep running the race. Keep your eyes on Christ. See, they had come to faith in Christ through Paul's teaching and preaching. And by the way, that's how we come to faith in Christ, through the teaching and preaching of God's word. That's what scripture tells us. We come to him by the hearing and the preaching of his word and being, remaining obedient to the truth. Paul's reminding them of this fact today in Galatians. And again, here he's using an athletic term. Paul often uses athletic terms in, the, in his letters. And Paul is reminding them, letting us know as well that our faith is not a one-day deal. It's not a one and done. It is a race. It is a marathon. Your entire life, walking and running by faith. We who are in Christ are walking and running by faith in Christ. That's what Paul's exhorting us to do. You who are running well, we're running towards the prize. And what is the prize? What is the goal? It is Christ Jesus. It is heaven. And not just heaven, it is Christ in heaven, to be with him. Many people want to go to heaven, but they just don't want Christ there when they get there. Well, we as believers, heaven is nothing without God. It wouldn't be heaven. Heaven is God in Christ, and we want to be there with him, to worship him, to sing his praises forever. Oh, that freedom in Christ. Keep our eyes on the truth for the prize. Eternal life with Christ, and you have eternal life now. The moment you were born again into the kingdom, you have eternal life, and you can never lose it. So don't let anybody deceive you in thinking that you can lose it because you're not doing X, Y, and Z under legalism, which is the law. So many churches imply these rules. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. These man-made rules that burden people and weigh them down, and it happens today in so many churches that those things that you can't do because somebody said that you can't do it. But in Christ we have freedom. But we should know what's right and what's wrong. Our conscience should tell us what we're watching, what we're listening to. Everything that we do should honor and glorify and magnify God. And when we see things that are not, turn it off. Change the channel. Go to God's word. The books we read, the magazines we read, the radio stations, the commercials, the TV shows. And there are some good things, but just be careful what we're watching and what we're listening to. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, do you, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Church, keep your eyes on the truth. Run the race of faith in Christ, keeping your eyes on the prize, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that prize. 
can't even comprehend it. Think about that day when we shall see him face to face and we shall see him as he truly is. I love how Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. What a bold statement to say. If we were to see God's glory at this moment, we would just melt. It is, he is so amazing, so awesome. But that one day when we are glorified, we will be able to see him face to face. We will be glorified with him. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us even just a glimpse. And we see God in Christ. God did show us his glory. He showed it through the Lord Jesus Christ who hung on the cross for you and me. And that should make our hearts melt. It should drive us to our knees and make us weep for the sin that held him there, as the hymn says. But with that, we're to be rejoicing. We are to have that joy in Christ, to run that race, to finish strong. Finish strong, church. Wherever you are in your walk with faith, finish strong. If you felt like you've been on the sidelines, get back into the race and keep running. When I was younger, I could remember a time when I was younger, much younger, I could run and run and run and run. My friends couldn't understand. I never got tired. Never getting tired. My friends encouraged me when I got older, more towards junior high. They said, you got you to run out. You got to go for the cross country team. You got to go on cross country or track because you can run. And I did. The coach would train us. I remember in Weymouth running up a hill. It was a big hill. At the time, I, I see it now, it doesn't seem so big, but to run up it, I could barely even walk up it today. <laughs> we ran up, we would do sprints up. It was called King Oak Hill in Weymouth. And we would do sprints up that hill 10 times, sprinting with everything we had to get to the top, and then we could jog back down. But get to the bottom, the coach is getting it. Run up that hill, run, and do not stop until you get to the top. We would run. And no matter how tired we got, we did not give up. I would not give up, would keep running. I would train, doing all I could to keep up with the fastest person on the team. That was always my goal going into each season. Find the fastest person on the team and follow him. As Christians, we're to follow Christ. He's the leader, and we are to follow him with everything that we have. Christ was always out in front of the disciples, as we know, going through the Gospel of Mark, he was leading the way. He was leading them to Jerusalem and they were following. That's what we are to do. We are to follow him, running that race of faith, which is Christ. So we, like the disciples, should know, do no different. Follow him and run with him, but always let him be out in front. Letting him do the work in us and through us for his glory. Keeping our eyes on him to win the race. And not to win the race for ourselves, but to win the race for his glory. Eric Little, an Olympian and a missionary to China, the man who inspired the movie Chariots of Fire. It's a great movie, if you, if you remember it back in the 80s. Chariots of Fire. Eric Little, this great man of faith who won Olympic gold, but he wouldn't race on Sunday. That was the big controversy in the movie. He would not race on Sunday because that was the Lord's day. Oh, do we need to return to a time like that when we will not do things because this is the day the Lord has made. It's his day. Eric Little would not run an Olympic race because it was Sunday. And he was able to get into another race and he won the gold. He once said, it has been a wonderful experience to compete in the Olympic Games and to bring home a gold medal. He says, but since I have been a young lad, I have had my eyes on a different prize. You see, each one of us is in a greater race than any I have run in Paris. And this race ends when God gives the medals. When God gives the medals, that's what we're striving for. Eric Little also said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Do you feel the pleasure of the Lord when you're running? 
your spiritual race? Do you feel his pleasure? I hope you do. What a great quote. I love that quote in the movie. <laughs> he was always sharing God's word. Wherever he was, even on the track, he would be sharing God's word, witnessing his faith with his fellow athletes. But most importantly, feeling the pleasure of the Lord, running his life for him. And as we know, ultimately, he gave his life in the mission field in China when he could have lived comfortably back in Scotland. He chose to go into the mission field and give his life, running the race and finishing it for Christ. Thank you, Lord, that he felt your pleasure and that we do as well. Are you living your life for Christ? When your day is done and you have run the day, do you feel his pleasure? We're all made for that same purpose, to glorify him, and we certainly do feel his pleasure when we run, spiritually speaking. And if you can run physically, I hope you feel the pleasure of the Lord being able to do so. But Paul is saying here, who hindered you though? Who hindered you, Galatians? Who cut in on you and distracted you? Who led you down a path that leads to a dead end that would not allow you to finish the race or to get very far off the path and have to come back by a, a tough, tough road? A road that doesn't lead to the finish line is what these false teachers were putting them on. Clearly, it was the false teachers of the day it's the same for us. This was who was distracting them. And it's all the worldly distractions that we have today that take our eyes off of Christ, that lead us down paths we should not be on. Paul's asking them point blank, who has turned you away from the gospel? The one I taught you when I was with you. The one that you were running well. The gospel that saved you and freed you from sin and the law. In verse 8, Paul tells them this Persuasion is not from him who calls you. This didn't come from God who turned you. God doesn't turn you away from the truth. He brings you to the truth. So this persuasion was not from God. It is not God, essentially what he's saying, who's turned you from the truth, but Satan himself. He is the ultimate deceiver. He is the one behind these false teachers the information they're hearing from these false teachers is not of God. It's important to note the Galatians have not lost their salvation by any means. They've not lost their salvation. It's impossible to lose your salvation. Oh yes, we can stumble and we can hear things that aren't true, but we need to bring ourselves back always. Searching the scriptures is what I'm hearing, Lord. Is this true? confirming it in God's word. Paul's telling them, you have been led astray. You've been led off the path. Let this text be a warning to you and me. No matter how strong you think your faith is, do not think for a moment that you cannot be deceived. Don't think for a moment. We can all be deceived in an instant. Don't let your guard down. Keep your eyes on the truth. You see, the Galatians were running well. They were strong. They were doing good, good in, in, in following God's word, Obe being obedient to the truth. They were running well. So what happened? They get tripped up by false teachers and preachers. The same as we do today when we hear false teachers on the radio and on television and through books. There are a lot of bad books out there in Christian bookstores. Don't think that every book in a Christian bookstore is a good book. There's only one good book, and that's God's word. Discern the truth. Be discerning about what you watch, what you read, what you hear, and who you're listening to. Because it is possible to be held, to be dissuaded you must hold fast to God's word and the sound teaching and doctrine. True, good doctrine. It's a word we don't hear much taught about anymore in churches, is doctrine. That Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. And on the third day, he rose. 
There's many people that don't believe that anymore. And they don't believe that God's word is infallible or true, that it, it contains error, that it's an old book. How wrong could they be? But people are listening and hearing that. And the drumbeats keep getting louder. The Bible is not relevant. It's not relevant anymore. You can save yourself. Just be good. Church, we need Christ and him alone. And we need God's word. Be on guard. Stay on course. Keep running the race. Be watchful. In verse 9, Paul explains how this error slips in. How this happens. It's very subtle. In verse 9, he says, A little leaven leavens the whole lump. This little, little bit of leaven eventually goes into the whole lump of dough. And it's, so he's using here a common phrase. It's a common phrase that we know. We know you put leaven in the dough, what happens? Makes it rise, it, but it spreads. It's still true today. Jesus even used it in Matthew 16, 6. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of false teaching. See, leaven in the Bible always, most always represents sin. It almost always represents sin in our lives, and it's a picture that Paul is painting here to make his point. The picture is that even just a little, even just a little will eventually grow slowly. It goes under the radar, to use a catchphrase. It's a small point of entry, but eventually it becomes deadly. It becomes a deadly, all-consuming sin, consuming everything eventually. And the result is you get rainbow flags flying out in front of your church rather than the cross of Christ. And you get the denial of God's word, that he is savior and he is the only way, the truth and the life. People deny that. Oh, there's multiple ways they say to heaven. Oh, how wrong they are. But how did we get there? It started very subtly with error creeping in slowly until now that people have just completely abandoned the faith, calling themselves churches when they are not churches, for they are not, no longer preaching the truth and they are no longer preaching Christ. It consumes everything. A little leaven in the loaf. In the 1950s comedy, Who Loves I Love Lucy? Who loves watching the old reruns of I Love Lucy? Well, in one episode, who remembers the episode where Lucy, her lack of cooking skills, she had no clue how to bake a loaf of bread. She took boxes of yeast and just put it, kept adding it to the dough. One box, two box, three boxes. And then she went away for a little bit, talking on the phone, probably with Ethel, paying no attention to the bread, right? What happened when she came back into the kitchen? The, the whole kitchen was filled with bread. It took over the entire kitchen. Love, I love Lucy. It's a great show. <laughs> but that's, the, that's what happens. When you allow sin, that little bit of sin to come in, it eventually takes over and consumes your whole life if you do not put a stop to it immediately. That's the picture of Paul's painting of sin. Deal with it. Purge it from the church, or it will purge you from the church. Purge sin from the church, or it will evict you. The little sin becomes the big sin. And I've said this before, as Adrian, Dr. Adrian Rogers once said, a man sitting at his home gets a knock at the door. Oh, let me go. Somebody's at the door. What is it? Oh, it's just you. It's just a little sin. Oh, come on in, little sin. But what happens? Behind that is sin after sin after sin. And before you know it, his whole entire house is full of what was once a little sin now becomes a big sin. Opening up his house to sin. Church, don't let the little sins in. The late Vance Havner has said, don't get used to the dark. Oh, church, we're getting too used to the darkness. Too used to it. Accepting the little sins and just overlooking them. Don't get used to the dark. 
The meaning of the quote is, don't, don't get used to the sin in, our, in your lives. Don't fluff it off so that our conscience becomes so dead to it that you no longer recognize it in your life. That sin that held Christ to the cross, cross we just take for granted, and we let it in as if it were nothing. But when it was the very thing that caused Christ to go to the cross, it is a deadly, deadly enemy. Pastor Alistair Begg had said, and I agree 100%, he said, it is sadly true that every Christian may grow by degrees so callous in sin that once it startled him, it no longer alarms him in the least. By degrees, men get familiar with their sin. The ear in which the cannon has been booming will not notice the slight sounds. At first, a little sin startles us, but soon we say, is it not just a little sin? Then there comes another, larger, and then another, until degrees. We begin to regard sin as but a small matter. And this is followed by an unholy presumption. We have not, fall, we have not fallen into open sin. True. We tripped a little, but we stood upright for the most part. We may have uttered an unholy word, but for the most of our conversation, it has been consistent. So we toy with sin, he says. We throw a cloak over it, and we call it dainty names. Oh, mistakes. Christian, beware of thinking lightly of sin. Take heed in case you fall little by little. Sin, a little thing? Is it not poison? Who knows its deadliness? Sin, a little thing? Do not the little foxes spoil the grapes? Doesn't the coral insect build a rock that wrecks a navy? Do not little strokes fell lofty oaks? Will it not continue dripping, will not continual drippings wear away stones? Sin, a little thing, he says. It put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head and pierced his heart. It made him suffer anguish and bitterness and woe. If you could weigh the least sin in the scales of eternity, you would run far from it as a serpent and abhor the slightest appearance of evil. Look upon all sin as that which crucified the Savior, and you will see it to be sinful beyond measure. End quote. I was trying to pick what I couldn't, but there was just so much there, so much truth. Thank you. Pastor Alistair Begg, run from it. Do not get used to it. Sinful beyond measure, even the littlest of sins. Be alert. Keep your eyes on the truth. In verse 10, if we have confidence in the Lord, you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. See, Paul here is trusting in God that the Galatians will come back and get on track, which they will to fight the good fight and finish the race, to finish the race set before them. We're all encouraged to fight, run the race set before us, whatever that may be, wherever Christ has placed you, in your homes, in your work. Run the race. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it through to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. True. True, true believers in Galatia's, Galatia will finish the race and we will finish the race because it is Christ who called them and it is Christ who calls us. He will be sure we finish the race. But these warnings, do not let sin in. Keep your eyes on the prize. This is what Paul has confidence in. He has confidence in God and we have confidence in God that he will see us through. However, he mentions the one who he mentions that is troubling you. Who is the one who is troubling you? This man, Paul doesn't know his name. He doesn't know him personally. But he's the ringleader. He's the ringleader of the false teachers. The one teaching falsehoods. Paul makes it clear that they will be under the judgment of God. See, the Bible makes it clear the hottest place in hell is reserved for those false teachers and those who corrupt the gospel and lead people astray. Jesus said it would be better that a millstone be tied around their neck and they be thrown into the ocean. So 
Jesus took this very seriously as well, to lead even the littlest one astray. We want to be sure, church, that we're standing on God's word. This is what makes preaching. This is what makes preaching and standing here an awesome responsibility and a difficult task. Because as I stand here before you, I do not want to be teaching you anything that is false and not in God's word. Because of what I know happens to those who preach falsehoods. So it's an awesome responsibility to stand in the pulpit of God. And it should not be taken lightly by anyone to preach the full counsel of God's truth in his word. Do not add my personal opinion to it or take anything away from it, but to preach the truth, to lead the church to the truth and from the truth. It should make anyone who considers standing in the pulpit of any church tremble. To be sure we're in prayer and being led by the light of God's word to speak the truth and to speak it clearly as it is written, not to add to it or to take away from it. This pulpit and preaching should not be taken lightly. No one standing, everyone standing in it will be held to the highest standards of judgment. Every preacher will be held to a high standard of judgment. R.C. Sproul once said that the preacher who smiles benignly from his pulpit assuring us that God accepts you just the way you are. They're telling you a monstrous lie. He's sugarcoating the gospel of love with, a, with saccharine grace. See, God does not accept the arrogant. God does not accept the prideful. He turns his back on the impenitent, meaning those who feel no regret about sin or one's sins. He maintains love towards his fallen creatures, inviting them back to restored fellowship, but strings are attached securely, for we must come on bended knee. Church, so don't fix your eyes on the man in the pulpit, but fix your eyes on Christ and his word and his cross, calling us to repentance and turning to forgiveness of sin for eternal life, surrendering all that you are to all that he is. Amen? And I'll finish quickly here, these last two verses. He says, but if I, brothers still preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? If that's the case, the offense of the cross has been removed. Again, we're seeing Paul refer to them as brothers and sisters, clearly implying they haven't lost salvation. They're still saved. The issue here Paul's dealing with is not salvation, but our sanctification, our growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ by faith alone, returning them to the truth, that's what Paul wants. Come back to the truth. Repent and come back to the truth and run that race. The false teachers were saying Paul was preaching the gospel of grace plus the law. They were trying to associate themselves with Paul to be on the same footing as Paul. Paul saying these people aren't preaching what I preach to you. They couldn't be further from the truth. And Paul saying if, if I agreed with them then why am I being persecuted? See, when you stand for Christ, when you stand for his truth, you will be persecuted because the world does not like the things of God and he hates those who embrace it. The, church, the world wants us to tolerate all things. The God of relativism, that all religions are equal. The moment you cross that line and say there is only one way and there is only one truth and there is only one life, Christ, Oh, you have found an enemy with the world. And oh, you will have an enemy with all your neighbors and your friends who do not know him. They will call you narrow-minded, bigoted. How can your God be the only way? Because he is. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And there is no other way. But if you embrace the world, as Paul is saying here, they'll love you. But at what cost? The cost of denying the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. And we know what happens when you deny the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. 
on that last day, God will say, away from me, depart from me, I never knew you. The cross is a stumbling block. It was a stumbling block for the Jews. It's a stumbling block and an offense to the world today. Unrepentant sinners hate the cross of Christ because it says we have all fallen short of God's glory. The cross says we are all destined from hell apart from Christ. The cross says there is only one way, one truth, and one life, and that is Jesus. And the cross says there is no there is salvation in no other name but the name of Christ. The cross is an offense to the world. But persecution ends with surrender to the world, accepting all the empty man-made philosophies. Paul saying, I am persecuted because I preach Christ. And he was glad to do so. Preaching the cross of Christ is an offense to the world. But we will stand on God's word. As offensive as it is to the world, we know it to be the truth. Keep your eyes on the truth. Everyone must come to the cross of Christ to be saved, to be saved from God's wrath. The cross is central to, the, to our faith. What Christ did on that cross. The cross levels the playing field for all peoples. The wealthy, the poor, the academic, the layperson, the doctor. And this is from Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's, my apology for not mentioning that. That's the cross. It levels the playing field. Those who do not merely accept the fact of the cross We glory in the cross. We glory in it. Why? Because from it we see Christ. We see the truth. If you have truly seen the cross, Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, it is everything to you. Is the cross everything to you, church? This is why the cross is central to our faith. Paul gives a graphic and harsh statement about those who are preaching the false gospel and leading people from the truth saying he wishes they would be emasculated. That's pretty harsh. Not only circumcise circumcise themselves, but emasculate themselves for what they're teaching. They need to come to Christ. They need to come back to the truth to repent, as we all do. And again, There is no greater glory than the cross. There is no greater hope than the cross, and we have that hope. We have that joy. Again, I ask the question, are you hungry? Are you hungry and thirsty for the truth in God's word, for his righteousness sake? Run the race. Keep your eyes on the truth. Do not, as we close, do not let the world distract you from your faith and stand on God's word. Encourage one another. Lift one another up as we have done. That's why we're here today, to encourage one another in our faith. Be watchful. Defend the truth at all costs. Run the race well that has been set before you. And keep your eyes on Christ. Amen and amen. Let's sing as we stand, as we close and sing our final hymn. The Rock of Ages on page 342. Please stand as we sing. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. 
While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. O oh Lord, may we keep our eyes on you, the way, the truth, and the life. Father, we just thank you for your cross, and we cling to it. We cling to you, Father, and we thank you for the encouragement and the hope we have in your word, and to trust in you, that you will help us as we run our race in you, and that we do not need to rely on our own strength, but your strength. And Father, I pray for our fathers today. Pray for all our dads, our families. Strengthen us, Lord, in you until you bring us back here again next Sunday to hear from your word, to be hungry and thirsty for it, keeping our eyes fixed on you. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. We ask, I ask your blessing upon the congregation as we depart from this place today. Now hear the benediction. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the goodness of God. Amen and amen. Have a great week in the Lord, everybody. We'll see you again next week.